Sorting through the many perspectives takes work. The seemingly never-ending opinions can get noisy. But what if we choose to change our vantage point? Think bigger. Dig deeper. Change the dialogue. Discovering the truth above it all. It's time to elevate the conversation. Hey, BC Boom family, it's Jalisa, and this month we are talking about grief. So you may think that grief is all about just the loss of a loved one or a significant other, but grief is the loss of something that you love and value or things that you found significant in your life. So some examples of that include um, you may be grieving a different change or a different routine that's now a part of your life or um, a city that you used to live in and now you're called to another city. You may grieve that process or that way of life of um, being in that city and moving into another city as well as um, grieving a job that you loved and people in a community that you loved being around all of those things are um, examples of how you can experience grief so as you continue to walk through life you will always experience grief and um, there will be a time for mourning and there will be a time for laughter and so what I've learned in my personal journey is um, over the last couple of years actually is that Grief is something that you have to invite God into. As we invite God into our emotions and as we invite God into the things that um, hurt us the most or the loss that we feel, he then comes and comforts us in that grief and he heals us in that grief. Uh, a scripture that he will always bring to me is Isaiah 43 and 2. And this was like a comforting scripture that he kept bringing to me during my devotion times. And so I want to share it with you. So it reads, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. And every time I felt like I was losing it or I couldn't handle the grief that God was giving me or that I was um, enduring, he will always bring me back to this scripture, letting me know that he is my comforter, that I am um, that he is holding me in the palm of his hands and that he cares about what I care about and about the feelings that I am experiencing. So as our ministry partners go through this topic, I pray that you take notes and I pray that you are transformed by inviting God into your grieving and into your loss. Stay tuned. Hey friends, Stuart, thanks for hanging out today. So I have a question for you. I want you to think back to when you were in elementary school. Did you have a difficult time convincing your mom that you were sick enough or hurt enough to stay home from school? Or was your mom a pushover, just a few coughs or one small limp or uh, and it was you on the couch all day long with chicken noodle soup, saltine crackers, Sprite, and TV all day, real talk. Growing up, I had to be on the verge of death for my mom to actually let me stay home from school. My mom, by far, was the sweetest person I've ever known. We called her Suge, short for sugar, because she called everyone Suge and was herself so sweet. But people all the time misinterpreted her sweetness with a lack of toughness. Just the opposite, her toughness was the stuff of legend in our home. So much so that as we got older, my brothers and I would retell the same stories from our childhood every holiday season around the family table. My favorite story to tell that my brothers were always asked me to tell was the time I was in our backyard and I attempted to jump off an empty garbage can over this little red wagon that we had. When I pushed off with my feet to jump, the garbage can was so light that it flew out from under me and somehow I cleared the wagon, but I didn't land on my feet. I awkwardly landed with my left leg under my bottom, 
twisted underneath me and all of my weight landed on that leg. I felt and I heard a pop and I immediately started screaming in pain. I tried to stand up, but the pain was literally so intense that I literally almost vomited on the spot. My mom comes running out and I'm laying on the ground and I'm crying so hard. Have you ever cried this hard that like you, <laughs> you have snot bubbles come out of your nose? And she didn't believe that I was seriously hurt. Now, she did help me inside. She let me calm down a little bit, but then she started insisting that I was being dramatic. For two days, my mom insisted that I was faking. She would make so many attempts to get me to quit being dramatic, which by the way, would always make everyone laugh at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Everyone that is, except my mom. Because finally, a few days later, my mom relented and took me to the doctor. X-rays confirmed that I had cleanly broken my femur in my left leg. Now, let me be really, really clear. As I've already stated, my mom, by far, the sweetest woman I have ever met in my life. I miss her every single day. And to those of you that maybe haven't grown up in my context, this may seem a little extreme because of her insistence, but I realize now why my mom was so hard on me. We were poor. Me having a broken leg would mean I couldn't go to school. And if I couldn't go to school, she couldn't go to work because she'd have to stay home and take care of me. And if my mom couldn't go to work, she wouldn't get paid. And her not getting paid meant our entire family paid a price. I have so much empathy and compassion for my parents now. I realized that my parents just wanted to toughen me up to some degree, but I didn't realize it then. Instead, what I did was I placed this really unhealthy amount of pressure on myself. Some of you can relate to this. I couldn't fail. I couldn't be hurt. And I could not be wrong. I carried that pressure into high school. And when I went through something like being rejected by a pretty girl, which was all the time, or throwing an interception or missing a game winning shot at the buzzer or even getting a concussion my very first day in pads my senior year of football, but refusing to tell anyone. I felt things like hurt, anger, embarrassment, and sadness. And on the one hand, I wanted to express those emotions and get them out. But on the other hand, I found myself thinking about what my mom and dad would say, kind of hearing them echo in my mind. You're fine. Stop faking. Be a winner. Maybe you can relate to high school me. There are all kinds of ways that you try to deal or not deal with difficult or painful situations. Maybe you feel like you bounce back and forth between trying to process things and trying to stuff things in just like I did. Maybe you say, I'd rather just not have painful and difficult things to deal with at all, which gosh, we all totally get. The problem is that you're gonna face some tough stuff in high school and even if you're in that small percentage that happens to make it through high school without facing it, it's gonna happen eventually. We all deal with it at some point. And for the sake of the day, we're talking about the difficult stuff that comes in the form of loss. Like we lose something, maybe we lose hope or confidence. Maybe we suffer an injury and lose our ability to play this season. Maybe we suffer an illness and lose our health for a bit. Maybe we have to lose our dream of going to the college that we wanted to because we didn't get the scholarly or we just didn't make the grades. Or maybe you lose someone. Maybe a friendship fades or a friend moves away. We've all gone through this. People you were friends with in junior high, you're not friends with them now. Maybe a breakup happens. Maybe a grandparent has to be moved into assisted living and so he or she is no longer right down the road. Maybe a pet dies. Maybe someone close to you passes away. Or maybe it's the loss of a celebrity who you've never met, but you admire them from afar. When we suffer loss, which we all inevitably will, it's natural for us to experience grief. We probably don't call it grief. We may even call it fear, and we may not even realize we're grieving, but we all do in our own way. Grief is this deep sadness that comes with the loss of something or someone you care about. It's this feeling we experience in the aftermath of that loss. And we all deal with those emotions differently. Some of us 
get them out, <laughs> right? We lash out with outbursts of anger, we blame other people, or we take it out on the people close to us, and then some of us, you keep it in. We tell ourselves, <laughs> suck it up, you're fine. We suppress our feelings and suffer in silence. Or maybe we try to numb our pain by turning to something that will distract us from thinking about it. I think all of us at some point or another will ask, where's God? This is a very big question eventually asked by so many of us who are experiencing loss. Let me first say this. There's never an easy answer to loss. There's never a nice bow that you can put on it. It's hardly ever possible to understand why something happens. And that's frustrating. I think that's why some people want to be able to explain it away and with good intentions by saying things like, there's no way that God could exist if bad stuff happens, or God's the one who caused it in order to get our attention, or just trust God. That's all you need to do or know. Again, those people have incredible intentions. As simple as these answers are, they don't seem satisfying, do they? They seem to leave us wondering, is that it? Which of these answers is the truth? Is there more to the story? That's what we want to talk about for the next few minutes. The first four books of the New Testament are these intricate narratives, both firsthand accounts and interviews with eyewitnesses about the example, life, and teachings of Jesus. Since Jesus reveals to us the heart and character of God, that's a really, really big deal for us to get a picture of who God is. One of Jesus' closest friends was a guy named John. John, most biblical historians believe, was most likely a teenager like you when he started following Jesus. And one dramatic event that John remembers and records about Jesus starts like this. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Just from reading these verses, we see that Lazarus wasn't just an ordinary guy. There was this friendship and closeness between Jesus and Lazarus' family. Even his sisters, when talking to Jesus, refer to Lazarus as the one you love. So we're talking about one of Jesus' best friends coming down with a major illness, and things aren't looking good. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Jesus was late. He missed it. The sisters suffered a loss. Lazarus was dead. He was gone. And Martha isn't about it and had something to say to Jesus. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha decided to confront Jesus. In fact, she went face to face with the Son of God halfway down the road. And as soon as she saw him, she told him exactly what she thought. Gloves off, brutal honesty, raw emotion. Jesus, where were you? Why did it take you so long? I thought you loved him. How could you let this happen? You ever heard the phrase, you're putting a Band-Aid on it? The idea is we're just covering up the pain or the problem and not dealing with the root of the issue. We do that with our grief sometimes, don't we? We stuff it down, we cover it up, or we act like we're fine when we're not. But that's not how Martha interacted with Jesus. She ripped the Band-Aid off. She said, if you had showed up, Jesus, this wouldn't have happened. Is, is that even allowed? Can, can you talk to Jesus that way? Will he lose his temper, lecture her, put her in her place, ignore her, or tell her to get it together and just trust God? Nope, not even close. Don't miss this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Look at how Jesus got in the middle of the emotion. Jesus was deeply moved. Jesus 
was troubled. Jesus was emotional. He wept. And the people said, see how Jesus loved him. Here's a massively important point that I hope you and I can remember. Jesus is with us in our grief. Whatever loss we're going through, Jesus is right there with us, feeling it with us. It's one way we know that God is good. Even when we encounter painful things, God is not absent. God didn't cause it. And God is not telling us to just trust me and everything will work out fine. No, God is close to us and walking with us. So when you go through a physical sickness, when you feel lonely because there's conflict with you and a friend, when you're sad because a celebrity you looked up to passed away, Jesus is right there feeling it with you. Now, the story of Lazarus doesn't end there. In fact, Lazarus' family eventually witnessed a miracle when Jesus raised Lazarus back to life. But I think it's interesting that Jesus performed the miracle after he went to the tomb. Jesus didn't just show up on the scene and immediately go hocus pocus and fix everything. He didn't brush aside the sadness or the anger. He didn't bypass the hurt. He felt and he grieved with them. This lines up with what we learn about God in the Old Testament during a particularly challenging time in Israel's history. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed and the people were being removed from it with no guarantee that they'd ever see their homeland again. In the middle of their loss, this is the message that God gives the author to deliver to Israel. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? I love this passage. What an incredible way to think about God in our grief. It's another way that we learn about God's goodness. God promises to sustain us, which means that God will help us carry the grief that we're holding. God will sustain us when we don't make the team. God will rescue us when one of our parents gets remarried and we lose some of their attention. God will carry us when that friend moves away. God doesn't say that there will be a bow at the end of our pain and we'll be able to understand why we went through what we went through, but God does say and show that God will be right by our side. God doesn't abandon us or leave us alone in our grief. Even as we grow older, God will sustain us. God loves us, feels what we feel, and will stay right there with us forever. I had this thought too when preparing to talk this out. Even though Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead then, eventually Lazarus died again later. And I wonder how differently did Lazarus' sisters grieve the second time he died than they did the first? All because they had experienced Jesus with them in their grief. In light of all this, there are a couple things I'd like for you to understand. These aren't things for you to do as much as they are things for you to know. And the first is this, accept the fact that loss is going to happen. This is what Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus acknowledged the reality. It's a fallen, broken, sinful, difficult world. We are going to experience loss. We're not perfect robots programmed to only experience joy and never pain. It's important for us to recognize that we will have trouble. If pain equates to us thinking that God isn't good, then God will never be good to us. Why? Because difficult things will always happen. But Jesus didn't stop there. But take heart, he said. I have overcome the world. God is bigger than what happens to us. God is constantly working, even when it feels like there's no hope. In fact, God is so big that God can turn what's broken into something beautiful. God can actually grow our faith through tough times. That's the second thing. Acknowledge that we can experience more of God's goodness when we experience loss. Because God is good and God feels with us and carries our grief, we can actually experience God in a deeper way when tough things happen. Maybe you've been around someone who's going through a hard time that says, wow, when things fall apart, you really find out who your true friends are. On the one hand, they're talking about how some friends fell off because they didn't want to walk with them in the mess. But on the other hand, they're saying that they discovered how some friends had their back and got in the thick of the mess with them. 
In the same way, you and I can discover how close and good God is when we face something bad. We can be ready to draw closer to God. Not only that, but we can actually draw closer to the people God brings in our lives because God will provide people to show up. It's just a part of how God shows up. Listen to these words that Jesus said. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's okay for you and I to express our grief when we're feeling it. We will be blessed and comforted because of it. It's a great place for Jesus to meet us, and it's a great place for Jesus to use other people to meet us. When we mourn, God will comfort us and will provide other people who will comfort us as well. Jesus is with us in our grief. He meets us in our suffering in big ways and in the smallest, most simple ways. Jesus comforts us with his presence and with the presence of other people. Jesus grieves with us and his big, compassionate love is always moving toward us. I hope that you took a lot of notes and that you are well informed about the process of grief and how to invite God into that space. I hope that you have an amazing week and that you continue to pray and allow God to transform your life in every area of your life.